All right, so I get a lot of people telling me that working with hand tools are slow. <clears throat> and so I think um, if you are looking at making multiples of things, which we talked about before, production woodworking, right? Um, if you're making 50 tables with 50 drawers, you have to plow 50 sets of grooves uh, in order to make those drawers, then yeah, it's going to be um, it's going to be a slow process doing it by hand, in which case it makes much more sense to set up a machine. But again, I don't know that we're doing 50 of anything, are we? And so for me, um, a lot of times I can accomplish joinery much quicker by using a hand tool. And so one of the big uh, tools that I use a lot is the plow plane. So um, this allows me to plow grooves very quickly uh, in boards uh, with doing very minimal setup and, and, uh, and not having to mess about too much with, uh, with the machines. So with a machine you have to find the bit, let's say if you're going to use, let's say we're going to use the router for example. Okay, if you store router bits like I do, <laughs> they're kind of all about, they're everywhere. And so once I find the one I'm after, decide whether it's a six mil or a quarter, um, and then get it into the router, set up the router table, do a test cut, fix the, fix the settings, all that other stuff. Nine times out of ten I'm done already with one of these. So we also just recently came out with a larger version of this, uh, which is the combination plane which is basically, as we talked about a little bit earlier, we talked about uh, how it is very much uh, the functionality of a Stanley 45. Um, so um, to be fair, I've got one of these and my plan is to buy a combination plane, but I'm going to relegate this one to quarter inch grooves and that's all it'll do because it seems like that's what I do the most of, okay? Um, the setup on this tool is fantastic. Um, there really is only one way that the blade can go in there. The blade, uh, when you place it into the body, you've really got a, um, a flat surface that that blade rests up against. There's no lateral adjustment, there's no messing around. So what that does depend on though, is your ability to sharpen straight, okay? Because if you end up with a bevel, or sorry, an angle on here, then you're going to end up with an angled groove, okay? Which is not, I mean, if that's what you're after, then great, you've, you've, <laughs> you've, made, you've made the grade. Uh, but for the most part, we don't want to do that, do we? So um, using, again, I always come back to the Mark II. Just recently um, put out a head that allows you to grip blades from the side. And so, um, especially in the case of joinery plane blades or chisels, we always want a nice 90 degree relationship there. And so because this has the ability to grip from the side on, you don't have to worry about the blades twisting. In this head, with the original head, if you had a small blade, you really had to cinch this down in order to get that blade to stay um, in place. Okay? So, so to set this up, the rule of thumb is that the blade um, width will determine what your offset is. So if you're going to do a drawer bottom, let's say with 6 mil ply, you're going to have 6 mil of relish or material that is there. Relish is a term that uh, timber framers use about wood that is uh, on a joint that it's supporting, right? Um, you don't want it too thin at that edge because then if you put anything heavy in that drawer, it could actually break the wood out and then you have a, a bottomless drawer, um, which, uh, which may sound convenient, uh, but you just end up with a pile of stuff under the table, which isn't really probably what you're after. So um, a lot of times I work referentially as opposed to using numbers. And uh, mainly that is because as soon as you get numbers involved with something, now you have the potential for error, right? Especially in North America where we still are using the imperial method, um, you know, you start adding, you know, one and an eighth to three thirty seconds and, uh, and, and, and then a sixteenth, right? You start adding all those together, you have to dis decide what the common denominator is and then do all the addition, reduce the fraction if required, you know where I'm going, <laughs> right? Millimeters is a little bit easier because it's base 10, Right? If you can add and subtract, you have a reasonable chance of success. 
Um, but for me, I just do it by eye, essentially. And so uh, in this case here, I've got a quarter inch blade. So I'm going to set my offset to be about, about the same. Okay. What's the, what, what, what's the result if it's not exactly the same as the blade? Nothing. Yeah, nothing at all. So really, uh, to put it plainly, I don't care about measuring, right? Same thing with the depth, right? Typically what you're creating in the groove is you're creating a square profile. And so the depth needs to be about a quarter of an inch as well. Okay, does it need to be exactly a quarter of an inch? Absolutely not. So I can just loosen that up eyeball that and then lock that into place and now this is set so now if I hadn't been flapping my gums the whole time it would have taken me about 10 seconds to set this up okay when you're working on the timber itself okay always make sure you mark your boards so that you know which is the inside and which is the outside okay there's nothing worse than picking a beautiful um, drawer side, drawer front that has beautiful grain and then mess up what direction you're going to put the groove on because once you put the groove in that is now the inside of the drawer whether you like it or not, right? And so we've all done it and uh, we will all continue to do it but it's good to, to try to, uh, you know, to try to keep track of that kind of stuff. Do you, you must teach the cabinet makers, Mark, the triangle, right? Yeah, so that you you can know which is the inside and outside surfaces. So the tendency with this plane is for people to start at the very end, okay? And so, um, yeah, let's do that, let's do that. <laughs> the wood is tulip wood. I just can't win. Hold on, let me see. Pardon me, is that kind of wood is it? Tulip wood. Tulip wood. Yeah. Oh, just won't do it. Remember to use your great one of those. And you might be able to move clean a bit off. We can get to grab it from over the back there. Oh, yeah, yeah, there. yeah. Possibly. Let's do that. We'll get there. Big part of woodworking is actually being able to hold. Oh yeah, oh yeah, that's brilliant. That'll work. Okay, so and and uh, you know what Peter says is absolutely true. When you're taking the tool to the work as opposed to taking the work to the tool, it's absolutely critical that you have the ability to restrain the wood. Okay, if we tried to do this without this sort of in place, we would end up chasing boards around the bench, and it would get quite frustrating, right? So. As I was saying, the tendency is to come all the way back here and make your first pass all the way across. That would be an error because what you're depending on is that this fence is going to travel perfectly along the side here and not wander at all. Okay, blades like to take the path of least resistance and so if you've got a bit of wood that's a bit softer or what have you, it's going to want to follow that and that may include coming off of the side of the board which can be problematic. So what I always recommend to people is that you start at the front and then you come back a little bit and then back and back and back until you get a full plow. And then what happens is, is that this will now register in that groove so that you get a straighter result, okay? Another thing people do sometimes in air with this plane is that they grab onto this handle with the all around Kung Fu grip. And the problem with doing that is that when you hold this super tight, now you are going to be imparting an angle onto the blade. So I always just tell people, even just palm it, right? It doesn't feel right when you initially do it, but it really does make it easier to use the plane if you just palm it, as opposed to, you know, hold around to the death grip. So what you really want is you need to be able to put lots of pressure on this fence. Okay, this fence is what is going to keep this nice and straight. Okay, so now I'm at the front. I'm just going to push forward. I think that'll lock up once we're there. Then I'm going to come back and I'm going to push forward again. And then I'm going to start a little further back. Uh, 
and then I'm going to come all the way to the rear. Okay, and take big shavings. Don't worry about, you know what I mean? Don't worry about the surface that's left behind underneath here, <laughs> right? That's going to get filled with something. So if there's a bit of tear out, don't worry about it. Don't buy the left and the right hand one, right? <laughs> In order to worry about grain direction. Okay, well that's not true. You could buy them if you'd like. <laughs> but you really don't need to. If you need to see a pair of them on your tool wall, then great. But uh, for the most part, you don't need that. Once you now have this all established, the blade is now resting in there all the way back. So now all you have to do is bring the plane back and forth. And then eventually up at the front it's going to stop cutting. See? And then done. Okay? So then I'll take my shoulder plane. Then I'll slip it into the groove here and I'll just take an ever so fine shaving. Okay? We're talking about small shavings here, just to ease that corner so that when you put whatever you're going to put in there, you get a nice result. There's your groove. Okay? It doesn't take very long. And again, if I wasn't talking about it, I would have a whole drawer done in probably less than a minute. So 10 second setup time. 60 second planing time and you're done, okay? You haven't got the bit in the router in that amount of time, right? So this is a great way to plow grooves. And again, um, I look now at the result and I see that I left a little bit less than the quarter of an inch. Is it enough? Absolutely, right? Do I know this dimension? Nope, don't care, right? Because it really doesn't matter. Okay, so that's the beauty of using a tool like this um, when you're working um, when you're working with hand tools. It's 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 just a really quick and easy way to get things set up. What's the maximum distance between uh, sort of, uh, side and blade? Um, yeah, so. About that much. <laughs> Hold on. Twenty six millimeters. Inch. Yeah, inch. Yep. Oh, look, there's inches there. Yeah. Inch and a inch and a eighth. So you know, that's usually plenty. For especially for plowing grooves. Grooves typically are plowed very close to the edge uh, for, for, for those reasons. You can also put a sub fence on here if you'd like. Some people like putting a wooden fence on here because then it reduces the chance of there being any burnishing happening on the wood, right? Yeah, you can do that really easy. We even include a couple of holes here so that you can just simply um, screw the fence on, right? Um, you could also do it at an angle. You could put an angled fence on this if for some reason you had to have a groove that was angled. Doesn't sound like you would ever need that, but when you start getting into some crazy furniture designs and you are working on an edge or you're working on a curve, sometimes something like that can be very handy, right? Uh, but most often you don't need to use that. You also have the ability to use a second skate, right, that you can put onto here and then it'll accommodate wider blades as well. Um, I believe we do all the way up to a three-quarter of an inch blade. We also do <coughs> blades that are fork shaped which allow you to cut a tongue for tongue and groove uh, applications. A lot of times you'll use that on a back in lieu of a ship lap or something like that um, in order to you know handle wood movement and that sort of thing. Okay so the plow plane is really a handy plane. 
Um, it gets used a lot in my shop because, like I said, I would prefer to use this method than to fire up a router, right? The router, you're, you know, you're putting, you've got to put your dust mask on and then you've got to put your eye protection on and then you've got to put your ear defenders on, right? And then by the time I'm in that hazmat suit, right, I don't even want a woodwork anymore because I'm having a minor panic attack <laughs> because I've got 10 pounds of gear on my head and this thing's already pretty heavy. Um, <laughs> Full of rocks and all um, so it, it just for me this is nice and you know you're producing <clears throat> you're producing this as opposed to plumes of dust and if you notice really difficult to breathe in <laughs> okay you could chew it but you couldn't really breathe it in and so for me that's that's another good reason I want to be doing this uh, well into my 50s uh, <laughs> and so um, being able to woodwork you know I, I, I my goal is to basically is to expire at my bench that's my goal in life and so uh, in order to do that I want to not be breathing in harmful dust because the dust is the is the we're so used to it but the reality is it's very dangerous right because that gets into the small sacks in your lungs and your body has no way to get rid of it right your body cannot expectorate it and so then you end up it just turns into mud and then it's a, it's a, it's not a good way to go COPD is not is not good um, so anything that I can do to prevent that from happening right and Peter's done a fantastic job with dust collection and all that other stuff in his machine room which is absolutely critical um, but it's not something that you want to mess around with because it is quite dangerous okay so are there any questions about the plow is there an option to do it on any curved work? Not, no. I know what you yeah, I know what you're thinking about, like a, a carriage maker's plow plane, which basically looks a lot like this, except it's got like a really tiny little sole, and it's cocked up like this, so that you can, so that you can follow it a, along, right? Um, not, no. We don't have a tool like that yet. It's a very rare tool. Uh, it's a very rare requirement. Um, to work on a curve. Um, there are other ways to do that, um, but they require uh, a, a lot more labor, essentially. Yeah. If that's a simple plow plane, mm -hmm. what's the combination? What's the difference with the combination? Plane? Mm -hmm. So the combination plane is bigger, right? Um, every adjuster on the combination plane has the ability to be micro adjusted. Okay, so right now when I adjust this, I loosen off these knobs and then I position it, you know, kind of manually and then lock it up. With the combination plane, you're able to put it on the wood. You could strike a, a line on the wood and then use the micro adjust to just dial it in perfectly to where you want it and then lock it into place. It has the same conditions with, the, with all of the depth stops, right, as well. Uh, on both skates on that plane, you have um, a, a, a nicker, right? And so that pre-cuts ahead of the blade so that it allows you to do cross grain work. Um, and then there's a whole host of blades that come with it or are or, or, or available for it. These blades fit that plane, which is nice. So if you already have one of these, you can use them with that plane. But there's fluting blades and roundover blades and uh, reading blades. Um, so, uh, and it, you can also do rebates with it because you have the uh, ability to uh, pre-slice the grain ahead of the cut. So it's it's uh, got a lot more functionality um, than this simple plane does. Um, but as I said, I don't know if I said um, I was talking to somebody earlier during the break that I'm going to keep this plane as my as my uh, dedicated groover for this size and then the other plane the combination plane will become my sort of specialist plane where if I want to put a flute or a cove in or whatever I can do all of that um, and, and then not again not have to use a router um, a power router to do that all yeah other questions on the plow yes sir without the fence um, with a jig for like marketry or something I've never done, so I can't say for sure. 
I don't know. This is the part where I usually try to make something up. <laughs> no, 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 it's not. It's not. I mean, I've never really considered it for that use, so I, I, so I don't know. Wouldn't you use a raptor plane in Melbourne? What's confronting what the advantage would be? Yeah, like I would use I would use the router plane for marquetry work, right? Because that allows me to um, get into very delicate areas and remove material. Because with with marquetry, basically, what you're doing is you're clearing out an area in the field and then you're going to drop your inlay in, right? And so I would use this, I wouldn't use this. I was just trying to think in my head where that would come up, but I'm not a marquetry specialist, so I don't, I don't know for sure, but I would think that the next plane that we'll talk about is probably going to do the trick for you. I think with you doing a line all the way down length for timber, then as things just garnish, it's really quite quick and easy to do, but I think going into a to blind corner stops each end, then you're going to struggle. Yeah, you can't do stopped grooves with this plane. Right, because you've got a nose on it. Okay, so in which case then if you need to make a groove that's stopped, then you have to look at a tool like this, as opposed to this. Right, this just does through grooves. And a lot of times with a drawer bottom, right, I'll do a through groove out the back, right, because nobody sees the back. Right, if I was really uh, worried about it, I could put a Dutchman in and, and plug that spot, but I usually make a fancy little uh, turn a uh, bit of wood on the inside of the drawer that makes it so that you can't pull the drawer out. So, because then you can just, you know, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> the secret's out. Vic nails all his furniture together. Price wise on that, I think they're about uh, 220, 230, I think, with five blades. Right. And then there's the plow, I think, I'm not sure the plow's out in the UK yet, is it? Oh, the combination? It is, yep. Yeah, it is out. I think they're 300 pounds for the, for the plane. And then uh, it comes with a quarter inch blade. And then you would get blades on top of that. So it's not an inexpensive plane. Um, but if that's how you want to work, then, then that's how you would do it. Right? And quite honestly, the, the results that we're getting, uh, I mean, the planes are selling like mad, which is, uh, which is good. I mean, you always have to worry at, at a certain price point, you know, how many are you going to sell? But I mean, a lot of people want them. So, so that's a good thing. Any other questions about the plow? Other than the other sizes, or is that the one? Yep, this is the one. Yeah, and then, like I said, different blade widths that you can get. But this is, uh, this is the only size plow, and then we have the, the combination plane, which is the larger big brother to this one. I think the confusion with that is that we call it the small plow plane. Right. Which interviews people think, where's the large plow plane? Right, yeah. right. Yeah. So the large plow plane is essentially the combination plane, right? But we, uh, but we named it such so that people would make the link between, you know, the original combination plane and then the, and then the, the much better nicer version. Yeah. Any other questions? No? All right. So let's move along to another one of my, and, and I love using that plane because it makes all these beautiful curly shavings and, um, <laughs> and it just, it gets the job done quickly, right? And you can just move on to another step, you know? Um, so I used to dread having to set up the router and do all of that and then, you know, run it through and then hope you didn't make a mistake or hope that, you know, it didn't come off the fence a little bit or what have <laughs> you. So for me, like, this is just, that's a real joy. Okay, so now let's talk about, um, let's talk about the router planes. So this is what a router looked like before we strapped a universal motor to it, Okay. Um, so, uh, sometimes, uh, referred to as the old woman's tooth, uh, I, I don't know where they came up with that. I, I've never seen, uh, somebody with a tooth that looks like that. <laughs> anyway, um, so the basic use of this plane is to create flat bottomed features. So whether that's a housing joint or as we call it in North America, a dado. Um, 
or if you're doing marquetry work or inlay work, um, you, can use, uh, you can use them to excavate uh, down to the thickness of your, of your inlay and then drop that in. Um, so it really is a, a quite a handy tool. <clears throat> so we have a large version, which, was the, which is the original one that we did. And then we came out with a small version, which um, has a small quarter inch blade. Um, this is a nice little plane for doing hinge gains, okay? Um, because of the round shaft, you don't want to be taking too big a bites with this because sometimes the blade can shift on you. So typically when I'm cutting a hinge gain, I'll chisel out the majority of the waist just, just shy of my line. And then I'll use this and then I'll, I'll clean it up and get it perfectly flat. So when the hinge sits in there, uh, it's, it's not at an angle or it's not, you know, there, when you tighten the screws, you don't bend the plate or anything like that because then your hinge is not going to function very well. Right? We've all done that. So then we came out with the medium. Okay. So this is essentially, um, you know, an inter, uh, intermediate size between these. The nice thing about this is that it uses all of the blades that the large does. Okay, so you can, if you've already got blades for this plane, you can buy just the body and then now you have the ability to swap those blades out. So it has the uh, same sort of a grip as the small does, which the real boon to this I find is that you can put your hands firmly down on the work and then you can just gently work into corners, right? So that you're not lifting up material that you don't, you're not, you don't want to lift up. If you're working with commercial veneers, right? You're talking about, you know, around a 40th of an inch and that is really, um, that's really thin. So to blow past a knife line or something is very easily done. Um, so having the ability to really firmly plant your hands on the work and then just, you know, pivot into the work and, and clean it out. Uh, if you've not done inlay work before, it's not for the ham fisted, right? You really need um, to be very gentle with it and, and have a lot and have patience, right? Inlay is a fantastic way to take your work up to the next level, but you have to understand that it takes patience and, um, you know, very fine movements as opposed to mortising, which is, you know, a little bit more my style where you just you know, pound the love right out of it. Okay. So, and then of course, the plane that often gets called cute. Okay. This is uh, the miniature. So uh, we have, uh, I think we're at seven now miniature tools. And so uh, a lot of these tools are regarded as, as toys, uh, but really, uh, if you're doing very delicate inlay work, this plane is awesome, right? Um, we have uh, people in North America who work in miniature, and so they'll do sixth scale uh, work with, uh, on furniture. So they'll make a Chippendale high boy <laughs> at sixth scale, all the way down to the claw feet and I mean, you have to look at the details with a magnifying glass, right? It's, it's brilliant work. I don't know how they manage it, to be honest, because like I can't, like I go cross-eyed just looking at it. I couldn't imagine working on it, right? But it's incredible the detail they can get. And they really enjoy these small planes. But for small inlay bits, this is fantastic, right? All right. So... Those are, the f those are the four different sizes that we offer. So let's just take an example of, um, of, a, of cutting a dado. So cutting a dado by hand is probably still the slowest bit of joinery that you can do. Um, Peter, can I trouble you for a uh, combo square? Uh, just 90, yeah, engineer square is fine, yeah, yeah. So we're just going to mark a dado and I'm going to fit it for this. 
Now while Peter's doing that, we talked about the spoke shaves earlier. This is a fantastic little project that allows you to work with a spoke shave. Um, oh, cheers. Um, allows you to work with a spoke shave and do some practice. So this is, this is, uh, this is Peter's personal push stick. Okay, so um, <laughs> he, he says he uses it as a template, right, so that students can make them. Um, he's not really that particular about his push sticks. Uh, <laughs> but the nice thing about this is it's got curves here, there, and everywhere. And so what that allows you to do, right, is know how to use a spoke shave. In fact, here, he's even got a couple of arrow marks marked that say, yeah, you got to go down this way and then down this way. Because if you just go down and up, you're going to tear out on the way up. Okay, you always got to work downhill. So this is a great little project. If you have a bandsaw or, um, or, a, or a table saw or what have you, it's always good to use a push stick, right? And this is a great little project to practice your hand at spoke shaves with. So anyway. So now, um, what we're going to do is we're going to put a dado into, into this board. So I'm going to start with a knife line. So a light cut to start and then a little bit deeper to carry on. Then I'm going to take a chisel. And I'm going to drop it into this knife line. And that's the beauty of working with a knife. And then I'm just going to use this because I'm going to dado this piece in. Okay. So now I've got my two lines to work with. So there's a couple of ways that I can do this. I can waste the material away using a chisel, right? Or uh, I can use a saw if I like. It really, it, it, there's a couple of different ways to do it. In this case here, I'm just going to, um, I'm going to increase the depth of my knife line just a little bit. Bless you. So having a nice wide chisel is handy for this kind of application. Okay, same on this other side. I'm just going to deepen that line a little bit. Don't go too hard because if you tap the chisel too hard, what happens is, is that the angle of the bevel is going to push the chisel back, right? And then you end up widening it look wider than you initially intended. Okay. Then I'm just going to create, oh, I don't like that. I'm going to create a small groove here. I've heard it called a bird's mouth. I've heard it called a knife wall. Okay, basically what I'm doing is I'm creating a kerf spot for my, for my saw. Okay, if your tools are nice and sharp, you can just simply press it in. If your tools are not nice and sharp, sharpen them. Okay, you should not require one of these to make one of these work. Okay. So I don't know if you can tell or not, but what I'm doing is I've locked my wrist and all I'm doing is just leaning forward. And then that's giving me my cut. Believe me, I can exact a lot more force this way than I can with that mallet. Let's clean those bits out. Now before we get too far, we've got to mark a depth line, right? Otherwise we end up sawing too deep, right? 
generally a third of the depth is what you're after. Okay. Um, again, I'm not particular. You don't want to go past half because then you're leaving very little material there and that has the potential of going wrong. Okay. So I'm going to err more towards the side of a third. Then I'm just going to drop a line there and drop a line there. Okay. If you want, you can take a fine pencil and drop a little bit of lead into those knife marks. If you've got more experienced eyes, um, that's, it's nice to be able to see those lines a little bit better. So a sharp pencil will just drop right into that life knife line and then now you can see it plain as day. Okay, so now just going to grab a saw. This is a dovetail saw, but this will do the trick. And then basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to register the saw in there. I'll just saw my way down to that line. Same thing on this side. I wasn't as clean with this line, so I got to be careful I don't make it larger than I should have. So now you've got those sides established. Now you, now you can come along with a chisel and get the majority of your waste out. So you can see how handy these are. I'm using the chisel bevel down so that I can control how I come out of the cut. If you do it this way, it's going to plunge deeper and deeper and deeper. Are you alright? Yeah, good. Oh good. <laughs> okay, then I'm going to come along the other way and just pop this last piece out because if I do it from the other direction I run the risk of blowing it completely out and then I'm in trouble. So now we're back up against here and then I'm going to take my router plane and it's got a stop on it, okay, a, a depth limiting stop. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to place this on the wood and then I'm going to lower the blade until I just sit in my knife line. And you can tell because when you're in your knife line you'll put it up against and then try to lift and then it won't come up. Okay, that means you're in the line, which is brilliant. And then you're just going to take that stop lift it up so that it's right up against that adjuster, lock it into place, and now you're ready to go. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to back this blade off a tad, because I don't want to try to take this all in one sweep, okay? Uh, you can see how much material is left there, okay? Now, given the right amount of force, <laughs> right, you can do that, but that would require me to run from over there with the plane in my hand and basically lunge at this with reckless abandon and uh, it's not a recommended way to use the tools. 
I would pass out by about halfway. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> you're so right. Oh, it's always good to have my friend Clive with me. He keeps me real. <laughs> so now, now I'm just going to push this through the wood. Now it's going to be a very uneven cut to start with because of course I've, I've kind of brutalized it with the chisel, haven't I? But I'm going to just slowly remove material until I get it all even. Okay, I'm going to do a little bit of preliminary work. I'm just going to put a chisel in here and I'm just going to knock this back a little bit so that I'm at my line pretty much and then I don't have to worry about blowing out so much. Okay. So essentially on this tiny little end here, I've gone to full depth, okay? Just that little bit, so now I don't have to worry about blowing it out so much. So again, just step by step, bring it down. Now, ultimately, if you remove more material to start with the chisel, ooh, that's too much, um, you end up not having to do as much of this part, but it's very easy to accidentally go too far, and then you're in big trouble. Okay, so the other risk you run, of course, is when you're using the saw is not going quite deep enough with the saw because, of course, you're, you're working to a depth. And so what I do is sometimes I'll get a little bit of material here on the side, so I'll just extend these lines a little bit so that I don't get tear out in the corners. And there, that helps clean it up a little bit. So now we're pretty much getting a full width cut. Once again, I'm just going to clean up those corners. And then there I'm at my final depth. then you have your dado. So again on a small cabinet you may actually end up only doing a single dado. I mean you'll connect your top and your bottom to your gables, right? And then a lot of times we'll put a center piece like a shelf, right? Which I suppose is what this could be. It's not quite in there is it? Good. Okay. Um, maybe this is a shelf you could make, right? You could put a bit of inlay here, right? Bottle of whiskey here. <laughs> Two glasses here, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, for some reason, my brain always goes to. Whiskey. Anyway. <laughs> but. So the idea is, is that with a cabinet, a lot of times you're just going to dado or, or house one component just to give that some extra strength and rigidity. And then you may end up with other shelves, but you may end up opting to put those on pins so that they can be adjusted or what have you.
okay? So again, it doesn't take a super long time to do it, but out of all of the joinery that you do by hand, the, um, the dado is probably the most time consuming, right? And that's where it may be um, tempting to use one of the routers that spins, right? But again, if you don't have the ability to make dust or you don't want to make dust or you don't want to use power tools, that's how you would do it, okay? Okay, it's very simple to do. Um, oh, I see why that's tight on the side there. There's a little bit of material that got pushed up. And that's why that was a little bit snug. Okay, again, the bottom isn't perfect, okay? But we don't care about that, do we? So I'll just pass this board around and you can kind of see what I've got there. There's the groove and the dado. And then we can move on to other things. The other things we find that rattle plane is pretty good for for doing our tenons. We're trying to finish the cheeks perhaps off the Oh, shoulder. yeah, yeah, yeah. But if not, if we use a shoulder plane on there, you've got no reference for depth. But actually with the router you have, it's those final trimming cuts. Yep, that's perfect. That's a good example. Okay. If I set this, same thing. Okay, if I set my lines, if I set this router up to match the lines that I've cut for this dado, or for this uh, mortise, tenon, <laughs> wow, <laughs> um, then what I can do is I can use this as the reference surface because as Peter alluded to, if you try to do it with the shoulder plane, right, yes you can thin this, but you have no idea First of all, if you're cutting up or downhill, or if you're taking too much here and not enough here, plus you get overlapping strokes, and because there's not a camber on this blade, you end up with grooves cutting into this thing, which is not good, right? But as I alluded to earlier, you can use, you can cut this a little bit fat, and when you're cutting it with hand tools, that's a really good idea, because not, I mean, I can get close to the line, but I still am a human being and I'm still going to have a little bit of tilt one way or the other. I'd love to say I cut dead straight all the time, but that would be a dirty lie, right? So doing it this way, you can now have the reference surface up here, right? And then just pair. And what you're doing is you're just putting weight back here. There's a couple of holes drilled in the top here. And what you can do is create an offset base, right? So now what you can do is you can basically have the router sitting on a longer board. You can take this handle off, stick it on here, and now you've got a big long reference surface that allows you to pair that. And then what you do to one side, you always do to another. And so then you can get them all lined up perfectly, right? Because if you're cutting a mortise by hand, each mortise is going to be slightly different, isn't it? Right? It's nice to, you know, to think that you're going to cut them all the same, but if you're doing it with a mortise chisel and you get a little bit of sideways movement as you're, as you're chopping, you may end up with one that's a, you know, a hair wider. And again, this is the beauty of not measuring anything, because if I use a tool like this, okay, to mark my tenons, what I've done is, is I've taken my chisel, not that this is a mortising chisel, but, you know, I line that up so that the width is set exactly to this chisel, and then I lock those two bars together, and then now I can set this fence to the offset that I want, and these stay, the, the relationship between these stays the same, and then now I have the ability to mark left and right, and then I haven't measured a single thing, right? There's no measurements on this, there's no measurements on this, there's none of that, right? So for me, I find that all of these tools allow me to work without measurement, 
right? I let this in. I don't. I don't. I don't care. Um, I don't care how wide this board is, right? It may be a nominal three quarters, 19 mil, whatever, but I really don't care because it's just going to fit into the groove that I cut for it. And so uh, it's the same thing with dovetailing, right? If we were going to dovetail two pieces of wood of this dimension, all you're going to do is take a marking gauge and you're going to pinch that board in between and then lock it and then that's what you're going to strike your depth line at. I don't care what that number is. It doesn't matter. Right? It's that, because that's what matters. Yeah? Okay. How are we doing on time, Peter? Cool. Half past 12. Half past 12? When you're ready, we'll uh, go away. Can I just ask quickly? Yes. How do you sharpen that blade? Um, it's, like it's magic. Yeah. yeah. No, <laughs> they're not easy to sharpen, I'll be honest with you. I'll be honest with you. So, Here's a couple of ways. So with the larger blades, the blade is not integral to the post. So you can remove this screw and then we've got a, we've got a small aluminum jig that basically allows you to attach the blade to that jig and then now it's extended Right, and you can do, you do whatever method that you typically would do, right? Um, I, when I was in Australia, um, I met with a fellow named Derek Cohen. Um, he has a, a blog, I believe it's called In the Workshop or In the Woodshop or something like that. He's going to kill me if he sees this video. Um, so nobody tell Derek Cohen from Australia that I did this. Um, but what he showed me, which was an invaluable tip, was is that he took a block of wood and then he carved a v-groove into the wood and then now he can put that in like that right so that the blade is sitting perfectly straight and then on his pillar drill he has a silicon carbide drum and then he pushes it into that drum and that creates a hollow bevel and then now once you've got the hollow bevel it's brilliant because you can just put it on a stone heel toe, sharpen, okay? And you can do that with these blades or you can do it with a blade that's, uh, that's integral, right? Like this one. Like when I saw that, I was like, Pew! I mean, I rushed home from Australia and made the jig because I thought that's brilliant. And my brain just doesn't work that way. Right? I would come up with the most complicated way to do it. And here's Derek has, yeah, here, just do that. Right. Very good. Yeah, check out Derek. He's just some really good, clever stuff in the workshop. He does. And he's not your typical blogger in the sense that he's a really good woodworker. Okay? Like, he, we were lucky enough to see his home, and his home is full of his furniture. And it just, and you got to understand, Australian woods are only called wood or timber by name. They're actually rock. <laughs> it's rock that grows from the earth, right? And, and there's all kinds of animals that stick to it that can kill you, right? It's a miracle I'm here, to be quite honest. But um, the timbers are so hard. And so normally for domestic woods, you know, you don't need a tool like this, a scraping plane. But in Australia, I didn't even really talk about this much, <laughs> right? Because the, this is what you need, you know? So it's interesting how, you know, they, the, and, and the woodwork there is incredible. If you've never seen some Australian woodworking, like they've got some serious design and building chops down there, which is uh, like, I don't know why I thought that that was extraordinary, but I just... I hadn't seen a lot of Australian work and now that I know it exists, it's like, wow, incredible. And the timbers, so everything's a different color now. And so it's a completely different color palette, right? I'm used to maple, walnut, cherry, birch, oak, those timbers, right? And that gives you a certain color palette. Well, in Australia, it's completely different. 
And so you get these salmon colors and you get these dark brown colors and you get these reds and it's just, it's absolutely incredible. But yeah, so it was Derek Cohen who taught me that trick. Yeah, Derek Cohen. And so, um, just, it just, it just works. It, it's a brilliant idea and it just works. And of course the drum is fairly small in comparison to what we would typically do a hollow grind on, which means that you don't have to refresh that hollow grind all too often. Now I had one person say to me, oh well, but isn't that tip fragile? Well, no, it's not really, right? You're not using it to hog out, you know, big blobs of, of wood. So it's, it's really just fine. Does the trick. Yes, sir. Smaller blades are on a circular column as opposed to a square column? Uh, yeah, no, uh, yes and no. <laughs> uh, I think a circular one, I'm going to have a real problem with keeping that foot. Yeah, yeah, of course, of course, yeah. So the only plane that carries this blade with the circular column is the small plow, or is the small router plane. It's the only one that has it. Everything else is, um, has a squarish blade. And the miniature? Uh, the mini, <laughs> Square. yeah, it's squarish, yeah. Yeah. I, it's those sides I'm interested in. I'm just thinking I'm not sure about how I'm going to sharpen Well, uh, to be fair, with the, with the miniature, so everything else we have is diamond profiled, okay? And this is square. So this you could just simply, right, do that to, yep. right? And then it'll, you'll, you'll get a nice registration there. They all come with instructions on how to sharpen the blades anyway. They do do, yeah. Yeah, there, there, there is. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, they come with instructions and they, but it doesn't come with Derek Cohen's tip, that's for sure. <laughs> so, I mean, that, I thought that that was a great way to do it. Any other questions about router planes? You can also add um, a fence to this, right? You have a, a small spot here and then you put a receiver on there and then a rod that goes through and now you have a fence. And so the cool thing about that is that you can now use it for stopped rebates, right? Because you're working right off the edge. You can only, you can also use it with a bit of, for a bit of inlay work. Like Peter was talking about, if you used one of these blades and you had a bit of banding that is, you know, the appropriate size, then you could use that to cut the inlay. We also have this cool head that basically supports two thin blades with fillers in between and so you can size that a thousandth of an inch accuracy to match a bit of banding that maybe you've made yourself or a bit of commercial banding that you've bought and then what that does is it scores two perfect lines and then you can excavate that material with a regular blade and then now you've got a perfect spot to drop that banding right in there right so and it allows you to literally sneak up on the fit by a thousandth of an inch at a time, which is pretty awesome. So the router plane is, is really, it's a, it's a versatile, a versatile tool. Um, and simple again, simple to adjust, simple to, to work with. And now thanks to a handy little jig, a simple to, it's simple to sharpen as well. Mm -hmm. I've got the miniature and then the, the bigger one you've got there and I think the jump between those two. Yeah. Yeah. With the fence then, could you use that instead of the plow? Yep. So if you're just getting one. Yeah. Be yeah. Both. Yeah, this will do, this will do, um, this will do both uh, through and stopped grooves. Um, and then, so, so this is probably the most versatile joinery plane. Right? As far, you know what I mean? Uh, I always talk about the low angle jack being the most versatile um, um, bench plane, but I think the router is probably the most versatile because you can use it for, you can cut rabbits with it if you want, or rebates, pardon me. Um, rabbits are little things with ears. Um, I don't know how we got to calling those rabbits over in North America. I just, you know, they're not the same at all. They don't even taste the same. I mean, it's. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I have done, yeah, yeah. Rebates are, they're a little woody. <laughs> um, but the, um, when you, 
you can use it for, for rebates, you can use it for grooves, you can use it for dados, you can use it for inlay. Um, anytime you basically need a flat bottomed uh, spot, then, then you can go for it. You know, there's other techniques for cutting a, a rabbit rebate where you strike a line along the edge and then basically you just hit with a chisel downwards keeping this edge on that line, right? And then remove the material and then do it again and then you can tune it up using this so you get a nice, um, a nice clean groove. Yeah. So if you're going to have one good joinery plane, that's the one. And a whole host of blades, right? Everything from, I believe, a sixteenth of an inch up to three quarters. The only other router type plane that we carry is called a, uh, a hinge mortise plane. And that is basically a router plane, but instead of a wide body, it's got a long, narrow body. And that's designed to work on edges so that when you are putting in a hinge, right, you can clear out the majority of it with a chisel and then with just two passes, boom this way, boom this way, now you're at depth and then you just move on, right? But that's a very specialized tool, right? You would have to do a lot of hinge gains or doors. A lot of uh, timber framers in North America will use that to do doors because it's not a fast fit door, right? It's like actual have to cut the joinery and so they'll use that type of a tool in order to do it. Yeah? Okay, Peter? <laughs> Brilliant idea.